popular right now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, so, the, the main idea that I want is that I don't like the bundle systems that exist right now for various reasons, and so I'm hoping that somebody, I was hoping that someone would be motivated by this idea to actually write it for me. So, <laughs> all right. So, there's not many people in here, but how many uh, are, of you are programmers or sysadmins? Or is everyone here a programmer then? Yeah? All right. So, maybe it will get written. All right. So, uh, currently, um, we have bundle systems. They're successful for the most part, right? People know about Flatpak, Snappy, App Image. Uh, and I'm not sure with Snappy if it's called Snap, SnapD, Snappy. There's lots of pieces to it. So I just added SnapD in there, which I'll reference later a little bit. But they don't actually do what I want. They, they bundle everything into, I, I mean everything, into a big file. And that's what everyone likes to call bundles. And you have to download them everything. You may already have a lot of the stuff that would be can inside of that bundle, like Chrome. I don't know if anyone's seen the, the uh, Snap package for Chrome, but it's like a gig for a web browser. And a lot of it is just because some of the libraries in there uh, we already have, but we're downloading them again. And that means they sit on our computer two times. Uh, so none of these really do what I want. They have a lot of overhead, whether it's when you're starting an application that sits inside of that bundle or uh, installing that bundle. You mount, you, when your computer's starting up, it's going to mount that as a file, part of your file system, so there's overhead there. Uh, many of them are compressed in, in, what do they call it, squish or squash FS. Uh, that's a compressed format, so anytime you're going to run something from there, it needs to decompress it. And the biggest reason that I don't like them is because they're not mine. I just like running my own code. <laughs> uh, why not? Well, I sort of went over that. They, they, don't all, they don't tick all the boxes for me. I have a list of things that I want a package or a bundle system to do. And App Image, Flatpak, Snappy, uh, they don't do it. And why do I want my own? I just do. There's, there's no reason. I, I would rather... Uh, have my own. I'm working on a Linux distribution of my own that's sourced. I don't plan on giving it to anybody, but I'm calling it Apocalypse Linux. And it's a source distribution, so you, you get the source and compile it. But I would like to somehow have bundles in there, or, or package management, instead of just saying, oh, well, you want in curses, go get the source and install in curses, or compile it yourself. So I came to the conclusion I don't want packages so much for end-user applications, I want bundles. But looking at all of them that exist, none of them do what I want. So that's, that's the big reason I want my own. And so looking at the existing ones, Flatpak, for example, uh, besides finding documentation on how it really works, being difficult, uh, I mean, they have some documentation that says that this is, this is what Flatpak is doing. This is how you bundle your application with Flatpak. None of them actually tell you what a Flatpak file looks like, the binary of that file. Where is the file system in it that's going to be mounted? Where's the, where are all the meta information uh, in this package? And how do, the actual file definition, I couldn't find anywhere. The, it runs uh, mainly desktop applications. All your applications run in a sandbox or a container, which, again, that's more overhead. And if you're just running a desktop machine and you trust the applications that you're running, why do you need them in a container? Are, are we afraid that someone writing an open source software is going to uh, purposefully try to hijack another process on your computer? It, the likelihood that a container is needed for desktop applications or applications that I run on my laptop is... Not, not, it's not really likely. Uh, Linux has survived for this long without containerizing everything. Um, I don't think forcing everything into a container is going to make it any better. Applications are one big binary, so when you download that application, 
you're downloading everything that's needed to run that application. That sort of goes along with bundles, right? I mean, you're, you're saying, I don't want dependency uh, from other places. I want to include all the dependencies in this bundle, and you run it kind of like Mac does with their, uh, with their dot .application files, their dot .app files. And again, it's desktop only. It, it, to run a command line program with Flatpak is really cumbersome. And so this is the best diagram I could find of how the Flatpak file looks and what it does. And you notice every application has a sandbox and it has data code and libraries. And then that bottom portion is sort of your shared libraries, the runtime. And I believe those are shared throughout all the applications. So, so it is minimizing some of, the, uh, some, some of that uh, code being duplicated in different places. It's, but it, it's not, not exactly the way that I would like to see it. And then that brings us to Snap. The most irritating thing about Snap to me is that it runs a SnapD service, no matter what you're doing. You, you, you're not installing an application. You're not even running an application that is using Snappy, but it is still sucking up some resources on your computer. I think that's a complete waste of resources, really. You don't need to. Once an application is installed, why would you need a service running in the background? It, unless it's for that application. To manage applications, you just need to, you should only have to run your application manager when you're installing or uninstalling something. You, don't, you shouldn't have to have it run 24-7. Uh, a lot of people claim that the build system is too complex for Snappy. I, I haven't run through it myself, uh, and I don't know that it's too complex. I mean, we're writing a ton of software. I mean, software is really complicated to write as it is. I doubt that this is any more complicated, so that's just something people say. Uh, it runs in containers as well. Applications are one big binary. And then here, for sure, applications are comp a compressed file system dynamically mounted by the host. So when you go to run an application that's in a snap, you, it, it actually mounts that, that file system right then. So there is a startup cost for your applications when you're running them in snaps. And then app image. App image is actually rather similar to that, uh, where it, uh, a, a combination of both of the things in Flatpak and snap, you have desktop only. It, runs your applications in a container or sandbox. Applications are one big binary. Again, that's sort of a benefit, but also something that I don't like about it. Uh, applications are compressed file system, dynamically mounted by the host again. When you double click that, it, uh, the beginning of your app image is a binary that knows how to decompress the SquashFS uh, file system and mount it. And that's sort of what that, the app image that first few bytes of the application is doing. And then after that, it goes and runs the application that it just decompressed and mounted. Uh, the most frustrating thing about app image though is when you're building your .app image file, it, you're supposed to do it with a really old distribution because it will actually use dependencies uh, based on the distribution you're building your app image for. So if you have the latest 16, uh, like 16.10 Ubuntu um, or whatever the latest one is, there's a good chance that your app image won't run on a 14.04 because the dependencies that it expects are different. So they always say, uh, on their main, in their documentation, they say, get the oldest possible version that you can bundle on and, and do that, and then it'll work with all the future ones. So it's always, it seems to be really future compatible, but not backwards compatible. And I was going to ask, does anyone know if this came from Glick 2? Because they're very similar, and Glick 2 disappeared around the time the app image started. Is anyone familiar with Glick 2 or seen it? It, it's a, it was a similar project that was housed by GNOME. Uh, and, I mean, it, it is really similar. It looks like it from features and how it works. It just looks like they got all the bugs out of Glick 2 and renamed it. But I can't find any sources saying, uh, saying that. So if none of those work for me, then what I'm looking for, though, is 
I don't want any services. I don't want to have some overhead on my machine all the time. I would prefer if uh, we could just install an application and forget about it until it's time to uninstall it or update it. And the sort of the app Git or whatever application, uh, or I was calling this one SPM, uh, whatever application that is, should be able to manage it just when you want to alter it somehow. You want to install a new version of it, you want to uninstall it, uh, or you want to repackage it up for being uh, distributable again. Uh, it needs to work online and offline. The distribution of Linux that I'm working on for myself uh, is geared towards not having an internet connection. It, it's designed so it, the name of it is Apocalypse Linux. And the idea is that we no longer have network. How do you get, get software installed on, on your computer that someone else wrote? In Linux, that's kind of difficult right now. We rely on repositories. Uh, it needs to work for the desktop and CLI because I spend a lot of time in, on the command line. And there's lots of utilities that I install for the command line that don't exist or aren't as good on the desktop. And with all of these bundling systems, they seem to be focused on desktop, and that's it. So if I spend most of my time on the command line, I would like this to be able to install applications for me on the command line. I want zero start startup costs, which means there's no compression, there's no containers, there's no mounting of file systems just in time. I, I want the minimal amount of startup cost as, as humanly possible. And then I don't want duplicate files. With all those other bundling systems, there's tons of duplicate files. If you have OpenSSL on your machine for each of those applications, you have OpenSSL like 15 times. And if they're different versions, they're going to be in memory different because ld.so looks at them and says, yeah, they're different, so I'm going to load it again. So in, and not only do I not want duplicate files on the machine, I don't want to have to download duplicate files because if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you're doing this on a cell connection, it's really costly to re-download things. You don't want to download it if you don't have to. And then the features inside of the system that I, I, I would really want. As a software developer, I want to know what versions of everything that's in memory. And I don't want to ship out code and have that distribution uh, build manager be able to dictate what version of the library I'm running. Because right now, if, you, if, if we were to write, so, let's say we create a video game and we push it out and it, it's using uh, uh, open a, uh, yeah, OpenAL. We don't know what version of OpenAL it's really running. Maybe the major version. We can say, oh, well, it's going to be OpenAL 2.10 is what we're going to ship with. But if 2.11 comes out, that distribution may up upgrade that to 2.11. It's still the major version, so it should work with our application. But it may not, and it might cause, un uh, it, we might get some undefined behavior uh, in our application using OpenAL if they upgrade to 2.11. It's a dynamic library. That's sort of the benefit of dynamic libraries, is you can upgrade them independently of the application, but it's also a problem because I can't guarantee that my application runs on every, every version of, of OpenAL within the 2.x. So I want, I want to be able to say, I want version 2.10 and that's it. If someone else needs 2.11 on that machine, they should be able to update that independently of my OpenAL 2.10. Then I want libraries are not installed into a central location, but into the folders with the applications. Does anyone remember how this works on Windows? If you want to, uh, if you want to install a DLL with your application, you just stick it right next to the binary. And it doesn't matter if someone else has openal.dll somewhere else on the computer. You have precedence if the DLL you want your calling to load is sitting next to your, DL, to your .exe. But Linux doesn't work that way, right? Linux says, hey, go to slash, was it slash user slash lib and go grab whatever DLL's there if possible. And that's where it goes to look. 
it doesn't look, if you're developing applications, that you, you probably have run into this where you, you want like SDL.SO. You, you want to use that, but it's not installed on, on the machine you're with. So you think, oh, well, I'll just drop it next to my binary file that I, that I have, and when I run my application, it'll find it, right? Well, it doesn't. Linux by, by default does not look anywhere besides the designated central paths for libraries. The only way to get it to look somewhere else uh, is to update your LD underscore library underscore path environment variable. And then you can say, well, look next to my exe. And that should work. So the developer's environment is the same as the user's environment, uh, eliminating the it works on my machine problem. This happened to me yesterday, actually, in a talk where it worked on my machine, but not anyone else's. And I still don't know why that happened. We were running the same version of pretty much everything. There was a little bit of a difference in the, they were running Ubuntu and I'm running elementary. And that was the only difference that we could determine. And it seems that that was the problem. Probably because there was a dynamic library somewhere on Ubuntu that was different than what I have on elementary. So it wasn't working. Uh, I would like that when I run my application, as many as possible of those dynamic libraries are controlled by me, the developer, not the distribution manager, or the, the person who is managing the builds for that distribution. Uh, and then CLI applications r are installed, just as if they were installed by a normal package manager. If you do app-get uh, and install and you name off some library, you're your binaries are installed into the user bin uh, location, that, or, or they're installed somewhere else and then symlinked over there. But you don't have to load any container application. You don't have to decompress anything. Those binaries are literally sitting on your file system ready to use whenever you want to use them. And so the thing here is I was like, do we call this a native install? Because bundles aren't doing the same thing, but they're not, not they're not necessarily native to your file system. So would, would it be called a native install of a, of a library or, or an application? All right, so the way I would, uh, that's a big, I think that's a big list of things that I want, and it might be a tall order. And if no one codes it, I'm going to eventually uh, because I have, to get, I have to get it done for my distribution. Uh, See, I, uh, I'm a bit puzzled. I haven't seen anything in your, your requirements that you, that you cannot do with like current package managers. Exactly. That, that's what I'm so going to be getting you to. You can do everything with current package manager, but it seems that you're, like, you want the convenience of bundles, right? And you bring in the same security issues than bundles do, mm -hmm. while you're stripping all of the mitigations of the security, security issues yeah. that come with bundles. Yeah. So I think you want to make a mess. Well, well, we'll get to this in a minute, though. Uh, th that's why it's, uh, why it's a bundle-based bundle, bundle -based package management. So we're not really doing bundles here. So, so the idea is that packages are indexed by packages, right? If, if you say, I, need, I have a package, and I'm going to depend on these five other packages, that's how, that's how packages manage their dependencies, right? You say, okay, I'm writing my, I'm going to write my video game, but I need SDL2, I need OpenAL1, I need uh, whatever other, uh, 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 OpenGL, I need, and you start listing off all the other packages that you need for my package to be able to run. That's sort of how like the .deb or .deb packages work. Uh, but instead of indexing by packages, what if we index by files? Because I can say I want SDL installed or SDL2, but I can't guarantee what version of those libraries are going to get installed. And, I, and what if multiple applications need different versions inside of a package manager? This happened to me just recently where I wanted to upgrade uh, a, a program I had, and when I tried to upgrade it because it wasn't in the repo, it was requiring newer versions of certain libraries, and it just completely broke everything when I upgraded. But doing this, what if we index by file? What if my application doesn't depend on packages, but it depends on specific files? And 
to do this, we could hash all the files that, that, and that be their unique identifier. And when you install your, your application, it's going to search inside of your database of all the files you have on your computer and say, do I have any of these files? And if I don't have any of those files, then I'll go download all of them. But if I do have those files, I'm just going to send a link to the one I already have, and I'm going to drop a little uh, a record in a database saying that this file depends on this other bundle or, or application. This, this sim link is over here. So if I need to change that in the future, we can take care of those dependencies locally on that, on that system. So this is basically what, what, why I'm saying it's a bundle-like package management system. Instead of packages being our index, we're going to use files as what we index, or we're going to view bundles as a collection of files, and all the files on your computer, uh, then, then we don't have to duplicate any of them because we know all the files we have. If we need them again, they're already there, and we just simulate them. And here I'm saying bundles are just folders. So a bundle could be looked at as sort of a fancy folder, just a folder that contains everything you need to run your application. And uh, it includes everything. Everything that you could want for your application, including po potentially user data, can be inside of this folder. Uh, and here's a little example layout of what I was thinking. So you have under opt, you have your SPM, and then under there you have your apps, and then you have your bundle name dot bundle, and that's just a folder. And in that folder, it contains all the binaries. It contains SBIN, which is a little bit special. We'll talk about that in a second here. Uh, libraries, and then all of the resources. So all the, those four folders or any other folders you need. So in my eyes, a bundle should just be a folder. And that's how it works in Mac, actually, too. If you distribute any Mac applications, or if you go into your, your Mac you have and look at a .app file that's installed under applications, if you right-click and open folder view, it's just a folder. And it just has all the binaries in there. It has the resources in there. It has all of the dynamically linked, the, uh, what is a dylib, the dylib is what I think Apple calls them instead of .so. It has all of them right in there. And going back to this real quick, uh, all of our libraries won't be able, if we leave them in that path, they're not going to be able to be found. But we can't sim link them to the central location either because then they'll start trampling over each other because of naming convention issues. So how would we solve the issue of, of those libraries not being accessible here if, our, if we have to tell the, the uh, dynamic linker where to find them at? So there's three possible ways that I, that I could think of to do this. The first is every ELF binary has a header section where you can tag the libraries that you need to run. And then, but also you can have what's called an R path in that tag header that says, dynamic linker, here's where I want you to look for my libraries. And it's sort of that LD uh, library path, but it is set by your binary that you're running. And so the idea was, initially I said, well, I could just write a utility program when you're bundling up your application and have all the dependencies and everything. Why don't we just inject that tag into the binary? But then I, I started writing some code to do that, but it got really complicated because it, it, it messes up with all of the addresses and the, the actual binary chunk of the, the, the data segment of that binary file. So I decided that was not, not the best way to go. If the R path already exists, it's easy enough to update it. But if the developer didn't compile with the R path in there, it's really difficult to add it. And then the second idea was, what if, I, what if we monkey patched ld.so? So on, on your computer, when you install SPM, we inject our, our little bit of uh, code into uh, ld.so. And so it knows whenever, it's, whenever it goes to load any dynamic libraries for your application, it knows to go look where the application started from. But then we'd run into issues if ld.so got updated by, by the distribution for any reason. 
And it's kind of a bad, like, hackish way to do that anyway. I don't want to mess with other people's binaries. So then the third way is using bash scripts. Now this kind of goes against my startup cost, no, no startup cost uh, feature that I want or uh, that. This could be minimal though. So the idea here is having launcher scripts and that's where that sbin comes in. So all of our binaries would go into the, the slash bin in that folder. And then in sbin, we would have identically named uh, bash scripts that are actually executed in place of that binary. And what that script needs to do is first add that the, the bundles lib folder to the LD library path environment variable. It needs to set the working directory of the binary and then anything else that you might need special for your application. And then it needs to launch the binary with, or fork the binary with, uh, with all of those environment variables configured how they need to be. And that should allow our application to find the correct libraries uh, wherever they might be at. Is this making sense so far? Like I'm, I feel like I'm uh, kind of scatterbrained a little bit, but. And so, but back to the, the using these as uh, like packages pretty much do everything I want. Uh, that is the point, is packages almost do everything I want, except uh, you get dependency issues with them. Uh, then for the CLI applications, uh, I really, really want to run CLI applications that are installed by this bundle-like system. Because I, I really tried to jump on the app image bandwagon initially, and and I, I really like it for video games, it's great. Or for desktop applications, if you wanna run an application and you have the network bandwidth, you can just download it and run it. Uh, however, I did run into an issue to uninstall it. A lot of people claim you can just delete the .app image file, and that's not always true, because applications can do things outside of there, uh, around in your system, and it's not really deleted. Uh, in the CLI application one, I, I actually, um, I left that second bullet point in there by accident. It says, well, this required variable path manipulation, or path variable manipulation. In a sense, it will. Uh, we need to update those, those SBIN uh, wherever, wherever uh, this bundle is. Uh, if you want to be able to run that from the CLI, we either need to update the path variable to include all of the SBIN folders for all of the bundles, or we need to symlink that S uh, the contents of this SBIN file to the central, uh, to the central SBIN on your computer. Okay, so again, one of the big points that I want is it needs to be online and offline. In an online environment, we don't actually care that it's one big file that gets downloaded. Well, we shouldn't, because if we get all the files that are included in that, that are needed for that bundle, uh, why would we care that it's a single binary file that we're downloading? We could have a single, bun a single meta file, kind of like a torrent does, and then it describes all the other files that you need to download, and then your, your uh, management software can go and download those from whatever sources they can. So very similar to a, a torrent. But then for offline, we need a single file-based uh, bundle, so a mega file like, like Snappy or Flatpak or AppImage have, and it includes everything. That would include all dependencies that you need to install that offline so that on your computer, if you had no internet access, you plug in a USB, install that bundle from the USB, and there should be no, oh, you don't have in curses, or you don't have uh, open ALE, you don't have some, some library that you really need, uh, that should be included in that file. And the reason I like this idea of it being file indexed and in a way distributed is because this happens. Have you ever lost something like a repository? You go to update your application uh, or, or install a new application for the distro you have and the repositories aren't available. 
I know uh, Brian Lundy just talked about this yesterday in one of his talks where he has this, he talks about this chip kit computer thing that he has, and he went to uh, go install stuff, and there's no repo for it now. The company went under, and so the servers are offline, and now the community is scrambling to get all of those binaries back into a repo so people can still have some software. And with this kind of a system, that can't happen. That's impossible. Because we're file-based indexing, like a torrent system, and uh, we can distribute the repository. Anybody who has installed that application can share that application back up because we're, we're not talking about packages. We're talking about individual files that are uniquely hashed. And that's their ID also. So if their file doesn't match exactly to the file that you're needing, you're not going to get that file. You'll only get the specific file you need uh, from whoever might have it. And that does have some security risks, by the way, because you're relying on other people who have their computers, they've installed the applications. Uh, they might play with that binary file and somehow spoof the, the hash algorithm. I'm not exactly sure how they would do that, but it is a possibility because you're pulling files from someone else's computer. But the potential of having a peer-to-peer -peer repo with this system would be it's cheap or free for package hosting. Right now, if you have a, a repository, there, there are great nonprofits and companies that are willing to give you free hosting for your repositories for open source projects. But do we want to rely on that company always being around or that, that nonprofit always being around for our distribution of Linux or, or, or of your application to still be around. Do you, if they go under for any reason or they decide they get a new CEO and they decide to shift their, their interests, it could leave us without repositories. Like what if uh, SourceForge who actually hosts a lot of servers for, for different Linux distributions uh, they give out repositories. What if they shift their business in interests? What if they're sold again? Uh, or what if their hosting just breaks and it's out for a week? That means that nobody can, can download our applications that we develop if that's where they are stored. However, uh, in a P2P, it's really hard to take that down. They're resilient to attacks also, sort of. Uh, you can't, there's no real way to, de, uh, to DOS a thousand different people who are contributing a little bit of bandwidth to upload their applications. They would have to DOS the, all of those machines all at the same time to effectively, uh, to effectively attack this repository. Then the bandwidth is distributed too. So not one person is paying a ton of money to allow everyone else to download their applications. And if one node fails, the package is still available. So we don't have to worry about, uh, like at Linode, a couple times I have gone to update, uh, do an app get update. However, Linode's mirror of, of the Ubuntu uh, repositories that they have locally were unavailable. So it timed out after 60 seconds and then proceeded to go up to Ubuntu's uh, repositories. Uh, that wouldn't happen. And basically, I, I was wondering, who wants to write this? Like, does it sound interesting enough to, to actually spend time to write? Yeah. Okay, um, this reminds me of like, the description that's called Gobo Linux. I was actually going to yeah. say, I found Gobo Linux on the plane right over here. I, I saw yeah. that. Uh, yeah, actually, it is very similar to Gobo Linux, except um, I, I don't know much about it. It seems like you have to have a kernel patch or something for Gobo. Um, uh, exactly, like on the website, they said the kernel patch is just for loop. Oh, it is, okay. Because, like, it hides all the directories from you. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you, you can, like, get a revision. Yeah. Because the deal was, like, messy. Yeah, and I, actually I plan when I get back home, I'm going to play with Gobo Linux because I, I saw that on the way up here. The one thing that I, don't, I didn't necessarily like about it is 
or I don't understand. I may come to love it, but they're saying that you can have multiple versions of the same application installed. And yeah. so I, like the program is like stored, for example, like pin, I don't know, like mm -hmm. uh, whatever program is in a folder, and all the versions are in separate folders. Okay. Yeah, so like you can, if you require some version of the program, you can just uh, write the version in the directory. Okay. Like I will go for the first app. But then there is this folder called current, which linked to the like, newest program version. Okay. Yeah. Nice. That, yeah, so uh, I was, I was, I saw that and it made me think like, man, now I don't, I shouldn't even waste the time with the talk. <laughs> but I do want to play with that one. I, one, do you know what Gobo is based on? What it's, is it its uh, own or is it? I think it's on its own, but I don't Okay. Know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll definitely be, be playing with that one or figuring out how I can take that and put it into my, into my distro because there's, there's other things inside my distro that I was, uh, that I'm working with is I built, I'm building my own desktop environment so that if you have multiple like Raspberry Pi computers sitting in your case, you have one that's the host node, and that's where your desktop sits. But when you run an application, you issue a command to go run that application on a different machine. But it, because you're running the XServe host on your, your front machine, you'll actually see the, the application running on your main, main machine, but it's actually running on a different child node. So I'm, I'm working on that, that, and I haven't seen that anywhere, so I'm still pushing forward with, with my own distro. Because I, I have like 15 Raspberry Pis at home, and I wanted to use them all together and found out that unless you write applications specifically for doing that, you can't use them together. It, it, you don't get extra computing power. So I was thinking, well, I could run an application on that one and sort of get like a portal to see it on, on my machine here. It may not communicate with this machine, but at least it's running and, and I can still see it, and it doesn't slow down my other applications. So... But thank you. That's I, I am interested in Gobo. Any questions, concerns? I know I uh, I don't think I covered everything that that I wanted to. But no, we're good. All right. Um, does anyone know what time that that this is supposed to end? Because I feel like it's really I it's really short. No, 1015, uh, perfect timing. All right, well, thank you for uh, sitting and listening to me rant about existing <laughs> bundle systems and how I think mine's better. But uh, if you want, uh, it, uh, if no one's going to be developing it, I will be developing it in the next six months. So uh, what, one thing that really made me think about this too was there was a failure with NPM uh, not too long ago when... Well, maybe it was a while ago now, when they sort of got into an argument and NPN just went offline and many, many servers that they tried to update just broke because their repo was no longer available. Does anyone else remember this happening or does anyone use JavaScript or do program in JavaScript? No? You're lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys.